Thanks, Nancy, for your very kind introduction. And thanks to the TEDx committee for the terrifying opportunity to be the lead-off speaker today. But in a way, the choice does make some sense. The theme of this TEDx conference is connecting the dots. Well, you can't connect the dots unless you have dots. So my talk is about making dots and taking dots, little dots of scientific data, and using the, them to sustain one particular and very special dot. Our species is changing nearly every part of the planet at increasing speed. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, organized by the United Nations, with the participation of thousands of scientists from all over the world and over 120 governments, just issued its fifth assessment report last week. The report was unequivocal in stating that the oceans and atmospheres are warming, um, snow and ice cover all over the planet are decreasing, sea level is rising, and the concentrations of greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, have reached levels not seen in at least 800,000 years. Now, human influence on this is clear. To quote the report, it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. Now, when scientists say extremely likely, you can pretty much take that to the bank. Climate change isn't just affecting humans. There have been five mass extinctions in the last 450 million years. That's defined as the loss of 50% or more of large uh, species. We appear to be entering the sixth mass extinction, but it's not being caused by a giant asteroid slamming into the planet, but by us. Our actions affect life on the planet to such an extent that some scientists now refer to our current geologic era as the Anthropocene, quite literally the era of man. So what are we going to do about it? Well, that's a subject for intense and ongoing debate with a wide range of opinions. But whether you are an organic farmer, or run a coal-fired power plant, or live in a house by the seashore, you should value the objective data that is crucial to the formation of public policy that's based on facts, not opinions. So to make good decisions and be good stewards, we need to find out what's going on. Well, isn't that what scientists and governments do? Well, the answer is sort of. Governments and funding agencies all too often want to see science that's focused on this classic path of pose a scientific question and design an experiment that answers that question and then observe the results and analyze and conclude something. Now, observations taken without some explicit question to answer are often denigrated as monitoring and usually don't even qualify for funding through research agencies. Now, doing climate science in only this way is playing the short game, and frankly, it's short-sighted. Climate change is a problem that is going to take generations to fully understand and generations to fully address. The average useful lifetime of a scientific journal article is just a few years because scientists are always using their current understanding as a stepping stone to build a greater understanding, and that's a good thing. Having said that, in 50 years, the, today's most advanced computer climate models are going to likely be only of interest to historians, but quality measurements for key elements of the climate system that are taken today will still be useful to scientists 100 years from now. This doesn't mean we shouldn't do science today, and it certainly doesn't mean we shouldn't act on what we know today just because tomorrow's understanding will be better. It does mean we need to balance immediate scientific productivity with our responsibility to the future. And as you will see shortly, the future is often closer than you know. We need to understand that there already is a continuous experiment going on all over the planet that supports and sustains us. If we take data on that experiment, it can be useful indefinitely. When we fail to take data on that experiment, the opportunity to do so is lost forever. Unfortunately, all around the globe, it's not just species that are endangered, it's observatory systems. The most consistent thing about long-term environmental monitoring programs is that they are short-lived. 
They are easy targets for budget cutting because politicians don't see the need for information that doesn't have immediate utility in their term of office. When systems and programs are established, oh, there are plenty of ribbon cuttings and press conferences, but support very often dries up within a few years, even if the operation and maintenance costs for a system are only a few percent of the initial build price. Let me tell you a few stories about observatories around the world and the efforts of scientists and engineers to keep them generating those important dots of data. Okay, fear not non-scientist types. There will only be two graphs in this talk. <laughs> All right. If you've ever attended a lecture on climate science, you have probably seen this one. This is a record of the concentration of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, in the atmosphere, taken from the top of the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii, and it samples wind that blows in over thousands of miles of ocean, so it's very well mixed and very representative of the overall CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. It's called the Keeling Curve after the scientist who founded the program in 1958. Now, the Keeling Curve is 56 years old this year and is one of the most important records, scientific records in history. Now, let me show you just two of the reasons why. If you look at the red line of daily measurements, you'll see that it moves up and down just a little on an annual basis. A representative year appears in the inset box in the lower right-hand corner, okay? What's going on here? Well, it turns out if you look at a globe, there is more land mass in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. From May through October, when vegetation is growing in the northern hemisphere, it takes up so much carbon dioxide that the planetary concentration of the gas in the atmosphere actually falls from October through April as vegetation, vegetation in the northern hemisphere dies back and decays. It releases CO2 in the atmosphere and the concentration rises. This is the first data that ever directly measured that. And in a very real way, this is the first data measurement ever taken that showed the entire planet breathing. Okay? Now look at the black line. That's a one-year moving average, so it filters out those annual variations. And you can see that it was the first, you can see it goes up and up and up and up. This is the first direct measurement ever taken that showed that atmospheric CO2 was increasing on a planetary scale. And when that level reached 400 parts per million on May 9, 2013, it made international headlines. Now, you would think finding funding for something this important would be easy. But in fact, this program has almost been shut down several times. In December 2013, the funding situation was so dire that a crowdfunding request went out on the internet for public donations to keep it running. Now, in September of this year, a private foundation stepped forward with $500,000 in pledges to keep the system running for another five years. But isn't this something we pay taxes to do? Okay, let me tell you a second story. El Nino and La Nina are two, the extremes of a natural phenomenon called ENSO, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Now, to get your bearings, these are maps are centered on the Pacific Ocean with North America on the upper right and New Zealand at the lower left. And Hawaii is that tiny little dot just above the center. The left map illustrates an El Nino condition where water in the central and eastern Pacific is warmer than average, and the right map illustrates La Nina, where the water is cooler than average. Now, in any given year, you can have one extreme, or you can have the other extreme, or you can have something in the middle. Why is this important? It turns out that the Enzo cycle affects weather over much of the planet with consequences to public safety, human health, and agriculture. One of the primary tools we have for measuring and predicting Enzo is the Tropical Atmosphere Ocean, or TAU array, of data buoys jointly operated by the United States and Japan. Correctly predicting the status of ENSO from year to year is worth literally billions of dollars in the United States alone, but in January 2014, 60% of the sensors in this array were not working. Now, here are a couple of my courageous colleagues servicing a TAU buoy in the open ocean. They know their business, but a couple of years ago, Budget cuts forced the retirement of the United States government ship that was dedicated to servicing the array and a shift to private contractors. And pretty obviously, that's not been working out very well. 
Now, this saved the government $6 million a year. Now, that's million with an M. To me, that's a pretty bad bargain when the potential economic consequences of substandard ENSO predictions in the United States alone could be thousands of times that amount. Okay, for the next story, I'm moving a little closer to my home base. Great South Bay is a coastal lagoon located east of New York City on the south shore of Long Island, just about 15 miles from where I'm standing. It's about 45 miles long and historically has been important not just as a recreational area, but as a commercial fishery that once supplied 50% of the hard clams in the United States and as a nursery supporting the regional marine environment. Unfortunately, a combination of overfishing and pollution has badly degraded the bay, particularly in the East End. Seagrasses and seaweeds are much reduced. They've been replaced by blooms of microscopic harmful algae. Fish and shellfish are much less plentiful. The commercial clam industry is 1% of what it was in the 1970s. So in 2012, my colleagues and I had a research project going in Great South Bay, and we had installed a number of, of observatory stations. They were yielding valuable information. The data was available on the web, publicly available in real time, and operations of the systems could continue for maybe 10% of their install costs per year. But the research project was ending. We're running on fumes of funding and very close to shutting everything down, and that was a fate that unfortunately had befallen observatory systems we'd installed around this region before. Then came October 29, 2012. Superstorm Sandy breached through Fire Island and created a new inlet on the eastern end of the bay. This is a natural phenomenon for barrier islands, but there was still a great cry to close this new inlet for fears of coastal flooding in the communities on the north side of the bay, which you can see in the background of this picture. But when we looked at our records from a tag gauge located at Bellport, New York, just across and north of this new inlet, this is what we found. Yeah, I know, it's the second graph. Okay. When you compare the tide record at Bellport, which was right across from the new inlet, to the tide record to a tide record at Lindenhurst, Long Island, which was 30 miles away on the other end of Great South Bay, to a tide record in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, which is 150 miles away across open coastal ocean, you could see that the opening of the new inlet made absolutely no difference in the flooding in Bayside communities. Partly because of that data, the decision was made not to close the inlet. And that was saved the government at least $15 million. By contrast, 10% of that savings would run every instrument in the Great South Bay Observatory system for 20 years. Okay? But wait, be like a late night TV guy, but wait, there's more to this story. The new inlet was at the east end of Great South Bay, and the main connections to the sea are at the west end of Great South Bay. So it's just like you get a breeze when you open two windows at opposite ends of a room, polluted water in the Eastern Bay was flushed out and replaced with ocean water. So the water in Eastern Great South Bay is the cleanest it's been in decades right now. Seaweeds and seagrasses are increasing, fish and shellfish are much more abundant and growing like crazy, and there are actually seals and dolphins cruising in and out of this inlet all the time. This is Sandy's silver lining. None of this would have happened without the new inlet being left open. And the inlet would almost certainly have been closed in the absence of the data we were able to provide from before, during, and after Sandy. Now my next stories began over 100 years ago. Henry David Thoreau was an author, poet, philosopher, social critic, and general gadfly. He was also a talented naturalist. And for many years, he would take daily nature walks through his hometown of Cambridge, Massachusetts, carefully recording the dates each year when birds arrived on migration and insects emerged and flowers bloomed. Researchers at Boston College are now duplicating these observations and discovering that, in the, that since Thoreau wrote his journals, the seasonality of these events has shifted in many cases by weeks. This is direct evidence of how the climate has changed in the 150 intervening years. And it's only one of many efforts that are underway to mine climate data from all kinds of historical records. One example project uses crowdsourced volunteers 
to transcribe ship logs from the eras of sail and steam directly into computer databases, giving climate scientists valuable information on temperature and weather and sea ice cover that are take, were taken by mariners whose lives and livelihood depended on accurate measurement, calculation, and record keeping. If you were an engineer in the age of steam and you couldn't take accurate temperature measurements, your ships tended to blow up. Tragically, not everyone recognizes the value of old records. One of the worst examples of this is Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which last year consolidated nine of their research libraries to two supposedly to save $443,000 a year. Over 100 years of publications, records, and reports were packaged into boxes, supposedly to be scanned one day, but for the moment inaccessible. Officially, nothing unique was discarded, but those ordering the consolidation were so apparently uncaring about anything but speed, it is likely a significant amount of irreplaceable information ended up here. Yes, that is a large fraction of a library in a dumpster. So what's the takeaway from my series of stories? First of all, data matters. We have a responsibility not just to do environmental science in a way that increases our current understanding, but to establish and sustain data gathering to capture both long time series records and extreme events for future use. You can't predict when important and illustrative events will occur. You can always do the science after you take the data, but you can't collect data after the fact. Data that might seem unimportant a week before a storm could be worth a million dollars, or in at least one case, $15 million the week after the storm. Hang on to what you've got. Established observatories can typically be operated and the data put on the web for a small percentage of what it costs to set them up in the first place with both long and short-term benefits. Maintaining established observatories should be recognized as a wise investment of public funds. And frankly, research funding agencies should expand their mandates just a little to allow continuing modest support of data systems that are established by research programs. Finally, search for buried treasure. Old documents can be mined for a wealth of unique historical data if we preserve them and support programs to digitize and make them broadly accessible. So, to conclude, I certainly don't have all the answers on how we're going to deal with this slow motion train wreck called climate change. But I do know the road to the answers is paved with little dots of data. If we're wise enough to collect those dots, those who follow us will be able to connect the dots in new and important ways for years and decades and centuries to come to the benefit of this beautiful, amazing, fragile blue dot we all call home. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>